and parts one and parts two I've done already. And uh, I was going to do part three, but the Lord uh, dealt with me to go in a different direction this morning. And uh, I'll finish that, Lord willing, the next time I have an opportunity to preach. Turn with me to Mark, the 16th chapter. Mark, the 16th chapter. We're going to look at one verse. Verse, well, let's start with verse 14. Mark 16, verse 14. Of course, this is after Jesus has been resurrected. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's my text. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The title of my sermon is The Church's Mandate. The Church's Mandate. What is a mandate? I looked it up. It's directly from, I mean, I know how to use it, but we've heard it, but I, I want to get more, more information on it. It's directly from the Latin word mandatum. I don't know if I can get a pick of water with this thing on. Mandatum, and that is a commission, a command, an order. Synonyms for mandate are obligation, directive, decree, and dictate. Some dictionary definitions are an official order or commission to do something, an authoritative command. Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Jesus left this as his royal mandate to the church. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew records his remembrance of the mandate. He says, When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to them saying, All authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Matthew 28, verses 17 through 20. I don't know what that is knocking on the wall there, but it really kind of bugs me. A mandate is not optional. It must be done. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In Acts 1.8, Luke records him as saying, Jesus is saying, we are to be witnesses of him in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. End quote. And this is the royal command, the directive, the dictate from the king of the universe to us, his church. I got these thoughts from a website called BibleStudyTools.com. They said, last words are powerful. Anyone who has ever lost a loved one knows the significance of their last words. Words said in anger can haunt your thoughts for years. But words said in love are something those left behind will cherish forever. If you knew your time on earth was ending, what words would you want to leave for your loved ones? What would you want them to remember? Just as our last words are precious and powerful, how much more so are the last words of Jesus, end quote. 
These last words of Jesus were so important to him that they, he wanted them to be the last thing his disciples heard before they, he left the, the earth to go back to heaven to sit on his royal throne beside the Father. This is, was and is his mandate. So I want to share with you some thoughts the Lord has dropped into my heart on this topic. First, why was the mandate given? The mandate was given because Jesus wants all the world to know this wonderful truth that he came to earth to give his life on the cross for the salvation of sinners and he has commanded us to let the world know it. In John's Gospel, Pilate asked Jesus if he was a king and Jesus said, you're right when you say I am a king. I was born for this reason. I came into the world for this reason. I came to speak about the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. John 18 verse 37. The mandate was given because it is the whole purpose of his incarnation and his ministry. He said, I do not seek my own will, but the will of my Father which hath sent me. John 5 verse 30. And what is the Father's will? That we are, proclaim, are to proclaim to all, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, verse 16. This royal mandate is the obligation we have to share the gospel with the world. Gospel, of course, as you all know, I'm sure is from the Greek word meaning good news. And it tells how God, who is holy, righteous, and just, and who must punish sin, is also a God of grace and mercy and love. His love provided what His holiness demanded. His justice and His mercy were reconciled in Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. So, to whom is the mandate given? Matthew 9, verses 37 and 38, Jesus said to his disciples, The harvest is truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore to the Lord of the harvest that he will send laborers into his harvest. I heard a radio preacher teach on this passage, and he said he believed that Jesus what Jesus meant was that we should pray for more preachers, more evangelists, and more missionaries. And, and that's true, yes. We should pray that God raises up more preachers and more evangelists and more missionaries. But he missed the greater part of that meaning, I believe. Ephesians 4, 11, verses 11 and 12 says, And he gave himself, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. He does call men into the ministry to proclaim, publicly proclaim, preaching and teaching the word of God. But the NIV version and other versions that I looked say it more plainly, puts it like this. His purpose in calling these men is to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up. The work of ministry is the spiritual service of every Christian, not just church leaders. 1 Corinthians 15 to 58 says all Christians are to be what? Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I'll never forget uh, saying that scripture to a, to a pastor years ago before I was a Christian when I was still playing music. We were in Atlanta for a month playing at the Purple Pussycat with Chuck Jackson. That was in the band of Chuck Jackson. And Wayne Hunt and I, who were practicing Hinduism at the time and were vegetarians, we, we found a place, a, a basement apartment in a house on Peachtree Boulevard. 
And we reason we, we rented that room for a month because they had a vegetarian restaurant in it and they had a leather shop and they had candles and it kind of was new agey stuff, you know. And so we, we took a took our boat there and there was also a barber shop in that uh, in that building. And there was a guy named Clint. Clint was the barber. And as soon as he found out that he had two musicians in the building, he made himself friends, he induced himself, and he started inviting us to church. He said, you got to come to my church. you got to come to my church Sunday night. Sammy Hall and, and his group were going to be there. We didn't know who Sammy Hall was uh, at the time. You know, we were rock and roll nightclub musicians. But he kept bugging us and bugging us. He would be every time he saw us for a whole week. You got to come Sunday night here, Sammy Hall Singers. So just to get him off our back, <laughs> we thought, well, it wouldn't hurt us to go to church, you know. So we went, and we went to this big church in Atlanta, Georgia, Mount Paran Church of God, big balcony and everything. The deacons would meet you at the door with a little badge, I'm here to help. And, you know, it was really nice. And, oh, you know, I hadn't been in the church since I was a kid and, and then not very much. And uh, so anyway, uh, we, Sammy Hall started singing and playing. And us being professional musicians, they were good. They were very good. And they would take secular songs and Christianize them, use, put Christian lyrics in them. And I remember they did Bridge Over Troubled Waters and different songs. And at the end of it, the end of the service, and by the way, I was only about uh, 23, 24 years old at the time, something like that. And he said, I want all young people to come up front. And, you know, fell out. I was young, and so, <laughs> so I, we, me and Wayne, Wayne and I went up there in the front, and he went down through the road asking people, you know, to say something. And I, I, you know, I haven't been to church. I didn't know what, how, to, what to act or what to say. And uh, but he came up to me, and what I, to my mind, I had just seen a great performance of a great group. And I said, and I said, I think, I think these guys really did a great job. I can't remember the exact words. So let's give them a round of applause. And everybody started applauding. And then Sammy Hall took the mic back from me. And he said, let's give Jesus a great round of applause. And man, that place, they stood up on their feet, standing ovation, they clapped and clapped and applauded for a, a minute. I mean, it was wonderful. And you know what? And I felt something spiritual. You know, I, Hinduism, the devil is, is spiritual. He's an angel. And he can give you spiritual experiences. He can disguise himself as an angel of light that he might fool even the very elect. And I felt something spiritual in that thing Samuel Hall said and in that applause. I'm getting way off the point. It wasn't in my message, but I just feel that of the Lord. And so, you know, I felt like, you know, it's the first time I'd ever felt anything spiritual related to Christianity. And then later, and I'm going to make my point. I haven't forgot. Lord, help me. <laughs> um, Later, uh, after I became a Christian, probably about four or five or six years later, a friend of mine and I had the occasion to go to a big meeting of that. What is it? That noise is when you say P or B. From that oh, really? Is that what it is? is? <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, maybe I'll take it off. I don't want distractions. Okay. Uh, later, after after uh, this friend of mine and I had the occasion to go to Atlanta to a big uh, national meeting in Atlanta, we thought, well, we visit the Mount Pera Church of God again. And so we went there. Actually, what happened was I left something out. I left something really important out. <laughs> After we played in Atlanta, we were going back to Dallas, Texas in our band van. And Key 73, that was 1973, Key 73 was going on in Dallas. That was a big meeting in, in, the, 
a huge meeting. Billy Graham was there. Uh, Johnny and Jim Cash were there. It was huge. It was thousands, tens and hundreds of thousands of people going to be there. And Clint, the barber, asked us if we could ride back. He could ride back with us in his van van, in our van van to Dallas. Now, this guy could have flew. But he wanted to ride back. You know what he did? He talked about Jesus the whole way. All the way. Jesus this, Jesus that, Jesus the other. And we, you know, we thought, okay, that's cool. And even Carol and I even went to one meeting of that P73. I remember, I think it was the day June and uh, Johnny Cash played. I don't remember. But we sat in the sun and got hot and got summer probably. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is Clint. Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now, jump ahead four, five, or six years. We go back to Atlanta. We go to that. We, we, we get a hold of Clint. And to go out to eat before we go to this meeting. And guess what? Clint took us to a Thai restaurant, and he had three or four people with him he was going to take to church. And so we went to church and then jump ahead another couple of years and I was at another meeting in Dayton, Ohio and that pastor of that church was uh, Paul Walker, Paul Walker Jr. was at that meeting at that, in, that, in Dayton and I saw him out and I went up to him and introduced myself and gave him a little brief story about having you know, Sammy Hall, everything I've just told you. You know, I gave a little brief scenario, thumbnail. And I said, and how's Clint doing? He said, oh, he's still bringing him in by the droves. And I said, well, tell Clint that his labor, in my case, was not in vain in the Lord. Because, you know, here I am, I'm a Christian, I got saved, and he witnessed to me. So this mandate is to every one of God's children. You see, the shepherd tends and oversees the sheep, but it, that's God's people in a spiritual sense, but only sheep can produce sheep. You know, the sheep bring in other sheep and the shepherd feeds them. So how is this mandate to be conducted? Paul said, I become all things to all men that by all means some might be saved. He goes on and says to the Greek, I become a Greek, etc. So of course, the mandate can be conducted by just one-on-one -on -one interacting with people. Having the opportunity to share the gospel with them. So, but how best to promote the word and the work of God has varied over time. The sling was an advancement in technology over throwing rocks by hand. The sling brought accuracy and speed and power. And with it, David slayed Goliath. And the story of David and Goliath and the little David and his sling has been retold and retold over the millennia, bringing glory to God and amplifying and enhancing the mandate, the presentation of the gospel. The printing press was an advancement in technology. Gutenberg invented the movable type printing press and the very first thing he printed was the Bible. The Gutenberg Bible is still some, some library somewhere. Before this, it took a scribe several months to hand copy on a scroll or parchment just one gospel. But because of this advancement in technology, the whole Bible was quickly produced to become the most printed and distributed book in the history of mankind. And the, the ability to obey Christ's mandate was enhanced and improved. The microphone, not that one, I guess, but the microphone and the sound system are advancements in technology. So more people can hear the Word of God face to face in face to face preaching. This microphone and this sound system enables people to better hear the gospel, thus helping us to fulfill the mandate. Radio and TV allow the masses. To be reached even more than face-to-face -face preaching. Untold millions of people have gotten 
saved by hearing and seeing God's word preached and sung and taught on radio and TV. Again, giving God's people greater access to the lost to need Jesus, thus fulfilling his mandate. The video camera is an advancement in technology to allow God's word to be recorded, whether preached or sung or taught or however, so it can be saved for future use. The internet has boosted our ability to obey the mandate so that people who never darken a church door might hear the gospel message while surfing the net and find salvation through YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or, or now X or, or Grid Getter or Rumble or any multitude of Christian websites. Resistance to the efforts to obey the Lord's mandate to go into the world, all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature, and go to the uttermost parts of the earth, teaching all nations, is disobedience to God, friends. Each of us should ask, what am I doing to obey the church's mandate given by Jesus? Cornelius was a soldier. It's the Roman soldier. But he was instrumental in leading his whole household to Christ. Dorcas was a seamstress. And she sewed clothes for got a seamstress back there. She sewed clothes for God's people. And she's remembered today, little Dorcas. Even now, as I'm speaking, thousands of years later, that God raised her from the dead through the ministry of Peter. Aquila and Priscilla were tent makers. They made tents. But they're mentioned throughout the Bible. It says, in fact, that they taught Apollos more the word of the Lord more accurately. He was a man eloquent, brilliant, Great orator, great in the knowledge of Scripture, but he didn't know everything he needed to know about Jesus to effectively fulfill the mandate. And Aquila and Priscilla. In fact, many times Priscilla is mentioned before Aquila, if you look that up. And it says, they taught him more accurately the word of the Lord. And I could go on and on, naming many, many others. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 14 through 16, you are the light of the world, meaning Christians. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. And he says, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. He said this, in the same way, let your good deeds shine out to, for all to see so that everyone will give praise to your heavenly Father. When a preacher points out here, he's got three fingers and a thumb pointing back at himself. Have you and I been letting our light shine? Have you and I been inviting people to church? Have you and I been sharing our testimony or our gospel or the gospel with others? Have you and I been faithful in fulfilling the mandate of Jesus? To fulfill the mandate of Jesus, to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, taking the word to the uttermost parts of the earth, teaching all nations, we have to go where the people are. Now, I, I looked this up, you know, the Lord led me along on this thing. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to his earliest followers in Jerusalem when on the day of Pentecost, when there were probably millions of people in Jerusalem so that Peter and the others would have a crowd to preach to. Jesus sent Paul to cities where there were many people. Of course, we can't forget he sent Philip the deacon down a lonely dust road to, to, to minister to one man, the Ethiopian eunuch, of course. Sent him from a big city-wide revival down on the lonely road to preach to one man. But 
He said, call it to Corinth. Corinth was one of the largest cities and the most influential cities of Greece at the time. He sent him to Athens, Greece, which at the time had a population of at least a quarter of a million people. He wanted them to go where the people were. God sent Paul to Rome where he would finish his ministry. Rome was the capital of the world at that time. It had a population of over a million people. He sent him to Ephesus, another large city. Ephesus is called, was called the Paris of its day. A large population. Jesus sent him to Ephesus also. What's my point? We of course should be inviting people to church. We we'll be, should be looking for opportunities to share our testimony or the gospel with people that the Lord brings across our path. We should be praying about that, by the way. Lord, give me opportunities of service today. Mm -hmm. Open doors of opportunity for me. Mm -hmm. Through technology and social platforms, we can reach millions one-on-one. -on -one. We can be like the, the deacon. That sad, lonely person sitting alone in a darkened room, maybe flipping through the web pages, surfing the net. Their life is, they're thinking about how utterly empty their life is, how meaningless life is to them. Maybe even thinking about ending their own life. They may come across a preacher's video or a singer or a gospel group's song singing on Facebook, YouTube, X or whatever and be saved, be delivered. In fact, I've heard many, many testimonies like that. Many, 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 many. Grace College, <clears throat> which I wasn't familiar with Grace College until I came across their website, has a concentration in what's called ministry technology. And an article on the website says this. Often in church history, technological advancements like the Gutenberg Press were held at arm's length by the church. This sometimes resulted in the church playing catch-up to communicate its message with vibrancy and clarity. They go on. One thing is certain. God is the creator and the innovative force influencing humanity's genius. He is the giver of gifts. And, in, and He is the one who gives insight to human intellect for technological advancements. Church technology can be utilized to further share the gospel, not distract from it, end quote. What was the first thing that was said over the, either, either the telegraph or the telephone, I can't remember. Why hath God wrought? The first radio transmission was a guy playing a violin that went just from the shore out to a ship maybe 20 miles out from Boston. He was playing Silent Night, the first radio transmission. We may not know until we get to heaven what good for God a video sermon or a Bible teaching or a gospel song done in person or pasted on Facebook or posted on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or Gitter or Rumble or etc. or other social media platforms is doing. I looked the other day and Brother Lester has Almost 300 views just on one of his messages on my YouTube channel. My testimony has about that many. And it's not about me. It's not about the preacher. It's about Jesus, friends. It's about sharing what he's done for us and will do for others in every method that we can. I become all things to all people. So that I can save people. That's what Paul wanted to do. That by all means, I might save people. Is, do we believe Isaiah 55 11 is still true? Do we really believe it? He says, God's word, God said, 
my word will not return unto me void. That mean, means empty. He said, it will accomplish what I please and prosper in the thing I sent it to accomplish. Revelation 2, verses 4 and 5, Jesus said this to the members of the church at Ephesus. He said, I have this. He first bragged on them. Then he said, I got something against you, though. You have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen. Repent and do the first works. Do you remember when you first got saved? Truly saved. Weren't you excited? Didn't you want people to know about this wonderful thing? Didn't you want people to know how great and wonderful the salvation of the Lord is? Yes. If you truly got saved. He said, repent and do your first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. End quote. Let us believe what Jesus said when he told us. Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and even greater works than these shall he do. Because I go to my Father, John 14, verse 12. Remember also that it is He that works in us to help us fulfill His mandate. I can do all things, Paul said, how? By my own intellect. He said, oh, I'm, in, I'm a great intellectual. I've studied under uh, 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 Gamaliel. I, 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 I know the scripture backwards and forwards. I, I'm a great orator. No. He said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is God in us that does the work by His Spirit. Scripture says, Now to Him who is able to do a far more abundantly all, than all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21. That's the ESV version. In closing, let's remember and review what the mandate is. As stated in the words of Paul the Apostle, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. <laughs> that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And that He was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, <coughs> then by the twelve. After that He was seen by over five hundred brethren at once of whom the greater part still remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. In other words, some have passed away. He goes on. After that, he was seen by James, the Lord's half-brother. You know, James didn't believe that his brother was the Messiah until the resurrection. But James became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And then he says, then he was seen by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me. Hallelujah. As one born out of due time. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3-8. through 8. And I'd like to add, he was seen of me. In August of 1976, I didn't write the day down. I wish I had it. But I know it was in August of 1976. I'd been going to church for several months practicing Hinduism at home at my grandma's house, in my bedroom at my grandma Pruitt's. And then going to church and doing the things that they do at the church. I thought you became a Christian by doing what Christians do. I thought if you went to church and you sang and you prayed and I went up to the altar and prayed with them. I played drums. I, I sang the songs. I knew, a, I knew a lot about Jesus. But I didn't know Jesus. There's a difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. Amen. And so I can add my testimony to Paul's. And that August 
Sunday morning, the Jesus that I've been singing about, praying to, hanging out with others who, 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 who served Him, He became real to me. He came to me. He introduced Himself to me by the Holy Spirit. He came into my life. He restored my family to me. My Carol wouldn't be sitting here. We wouldn't have uh, Lisa and Jenny if, if the Lord hadn't restored my family to me. He called me to preach His gospel. And I could go on and on. That's the gospel. Amen. That's the mandate. And will you and I be found faithfully laboring to obey His mandate when the Lord of the harvest comes? If we have been disobedience, disobedient in not trying to fulfill His mandate to the best of our ability, it's wonderful to know that Jesus will forgive us if we, when we repent. Just as David asked God to renew a right spirit in him and restore him to, the, to him the joy of his salvation in Psalm 51 verses 10 and 12, we can ask Jesus to forgive us of our recalcitrance and our reluctance to fulfill his mandate. I heard one preacher say, the problem, the reason Christians won't share the gospel is because of back trouble. You see, they've got a yellow streak from here to here. <laughs> That's the problem. And those of you who have never met Jesus, maybe someone here, maybe now I'm going to look at the camera. You can know Jesus. You can know whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Then throw yourself with reckless abandon into the merciful arms of Jesus, asking Him to forgive you of your sins, asking Him to be your Lord and your Savior. He will forgive you and make you His forever. Then you will also have the honor and the privilege of sharing His mandate with others. Amen. Bow with me, please. Lord, I've delivered my soul of what You've given me. And Lord, forgive me where I've been reluctant and outright disobedient in sharing the gospel, not just from the pulpit, Lord, but from opportunities that I've let get by me. Lord, help us all to pray to you. Lord, give us opportunities of service. Open doors of opportunity for us. Help us to be useful in the work of the kingdom. Make us tools in your hand, Lord. Lord, that this us individually and this church corporately can reach out to the world and share this wonderful truth, this wonderful gospel with others. Lord, let it be our life. Let it be our breath. Let it be like our necessary food, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you come to the singers, play a good